with us this morning. Good morning, how's everyone doing? Good. good, so good to see you all here this morning with us. Um, if you are joining us online, remember to check in and let us know how many are worshiping with you. Want to remind everybody that we do meet on Wednesday nights for you church. We do meet here in the sanctuary at 6.30 for worship and then we break off into our small groups. You're always welcome to join us on, for you church on Wednesdays. Let's stand and we'll get started with worship this morning.
worship in spirit and in truth this morning. No. Amen. And um, our um, call to worship is from Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land, there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than mine. My lips shall praise thee and thus will I bless thee. While I live, I will lift up my hands in your name. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. All right, let's continue our worship. Thank you, Jesus. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in all his love for me. All his love for me. Thank you. 
to um, lift up Jim Dunn this morning who is in Wichita at the Heart Hospital with medical concerns. So praying for Jim and, and Kara Dunn. Lord, in your mercy. We also want to continue to pray for the family of Mary Parks who passed away this past week. So keep them in your prayers. Lord, in your mercy. We also want to lift up our, pos- our pastor, Todd Gwynn, who was in an ATV accident this weekend. So he is pulled through. He's fine but just keep him in your prayers, speedy recovery. Lord, in your mercy. Are there any others you would like to lift up this morning? Yes, sir. The family of Sarah King Etzel. Sarah King is a former resident of okay. Moses who passed away in a house fire. Okay, the family of Sarah King, formerly Etzel, who was a former resident of Ulysses, she passed away in a house fire last week, so let's keep that family in our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Okay, if you'll bow your heads with me, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful, Lord, that we're able to come together and worship you, that we're able to come to your feet, Lord, and lay our requests. Lord, for all those who are going through medical and problems, Lord, who are hurting, who need healing, we lift them up to you. Praying for the family of Mary Parks, Lord. Praying for the family of Sarah King. We pray for healing for our Pastor Todd. We lift these up to you, Lord, and know that your, your healing power is with them. We pray for peace and comfort, Lord. And for those hearts searching for answers, Lord, bring them answers. Give them guidance. May every heart turn to you, Lord, as you are our only answer. Lord, I pray for this church and lift them up to you, each member. Be with each of us, Lord, and continue to do your will in our lives. Lord, we are here and we open our hearts to you. Let us be a vessel. Use each of us, Lord, to be a light in this world. We give you thanks for this church family. And Lord, we come together and pray as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power, the power and the glory forever. Amen. You're welcome to um, stay seated as we continue to worship, or you may stand. Let's continue.
didn't know that song till today, so I got in trouble by Sam. Really? That's like the classic, like Amazing Grace. Sorry, I didn't know it. Beautiful. You may be seated. Today's scripture is from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 19 and 20. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, kids, come on up. It's time for Steps of Faith with Miss Samantha. Soul Patrol with trivia. Does anybody know what the question was that Thomas was the answer to? Who was the doubting disciple? Remember that question? We used to talk about that all of the time. And that was kind of what Thomas got to be known by. I don't know if you've ever really thought much about that, but that's kind of a pretty negative thing. Would you want to be known as that doubting person when it comes to Jesus? Probably not. Well, Thomas was a disciple who showed some doubt and asked questions when Jesus was raised from the dead. Thomas couldn't wrap his head around how such a crazy idea could have happened. He watched Jesus die, and how could it be that three days later, Jesus was back? It just didn't make any sense at all. The cool part of the story is what happened when he had those doubts. The disciples didn't reject him and kick him out of the cool kids club. They stayed with him, and they loved him, and they cared for him and while he worked through his questions. You guys are dead today. <laughs> Is anybody paying attention at all? Yeah? You are? That's awesome. Very good. All right, so you would think that Jesus might be a little bit mad or disappointed in Thomas because here he had just defeated death, and one of his closest friends didn't truly believe that he had done it. So instead of being mad and being upset with Thomas, Jesus went to him because he wanted him to, he wanted to help him when he was in that time of struggle. He didn't try to make him feel bad, try to make him look silly for his lack of understanding. He went in love to help guide Thomas on his faith journey. So that's what I want us to talk about today. Jesus and his disciples were there for Thomas to support him, to guide him and love him and allow him to experience the truth in a way that he could learn and he could grow from it. That is the perfect example of what we as the church are supposed to do for other Christians. We can't expect that everyone will have perfect faith. Does anybody in the room have perfect faith? No, absolutely not. It's just not something that happens for us. We, will, we have to be willing to love and support and guide our neighbors when they're experiencing those times of spiritual struggle. So I brought stuff with me this morning. I always have something in here. So I've got an egg, and this egg here represents any one of us when we're faced with any kind of questions about God. Do you guys still have a lot of questions about God? Questions about your faith? Absolutely. So we all go through this. At some point, we are all just like this egg. So maybe it's just that we don't understand something, or maybe it's just that you have a little doubt about what you're hearing. But on its own, do you think this little guy can stand up? Do you think he can stand straight up? Let me try it. No, you don't even want me to try it? Thanks, Brett. <laughs> well, he doesn't stand up on its own. On its own, this little Christian cannot stand up and weather the storms and get through its struggles. So we're going to bring in the church, that little bag of church in here. So we're going to bring in the church for help. So this is really salt that's representing the church, and this represents all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. So the church comes in. Do you think the church can help lift him up? Okay, I need everybody to hold their breath and pray because this is really hard. Okay, so the church comes in, and this egg, it's got some struggles. But when the church comes in, has a little bit of extra help for that believer that's going through some crisis, that's going through struggles, with their help, that egg can stand tall and strong. Pretty cool, right? 
Could it do it all by itself? Absolutely not. Got that one done fair faster than I have before. That's what we're called to do, guys. Jesus instructed us to be the church. That doesn't just mean that we show up on Sundays or Wednesdays. It means being here for one another. It means lifting one another up and giving each other support when things are hard. It means loving and encouraging each other just as Jesus and the disciples did for Thomas. So I want you guys to do that for one another. Someday, you're going to be my age and you're going to be sitting in church, and I hope that you can look back on these moments and you can talk about each other and say that you learned about Jesus together and you helped each other so that you could know him better and you can learn how to serve him. That is what the church is here for. And I'm really glad every single one of you is here on this journey with us. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us and guiding us even when we struggle or fail you. We are so undeserving of your love and grace and so thankful that you provide it unconditionally. Help us to live by your example and love and support other believers on their journey just as you did for Thomas. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can head back to your seats. We have a little special treat this morning. Um, our bishop, Pastor Rubens, Ruben Sines, has recorded a special message for us, so we're going to watch that during sermon time today, so we'll go ahead and get that up. Friends, the joy of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, be with your spirits this second Sunday after Easter. There's an elephant in the room, is a common phrase. It is used in situations when everyone is aware of a problem, but they choose to ignore the problem or decide not to acknowledge it. The problem in today's gospel reading is Thomas's elephant-sized spiritual question. He's not yet persuaded that Jesus is risen, despite the claims of his faith community. It had been a long and terrifying time for Jesus' followers. On Palm Sunday, just two weeks before, they passed in the privileges and glory of being Jesus' disciples and followers. Then, one week later, they witnessed the betrayal, arrest, crucifixion, and burial of Jesus. In response, they hid in a house and locked the doors for fear of the authorities. Their fears gave way to hope when Jesus came and stood among them, gave them his peace, and breathed on them the Holy Spirit. Thomas, however, we are told, was absent. No details are provided as to his whereabouts when Jesus came to the disciples the first time. But when Thomas does rejoin the disciples, they tell him what happened. Thomas is not persuaded that Jesus has risen. He wants hard evidence as a condition to accepting Christ's resurrection from the dead. So who was Thomas? The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke only list Thomas as one of Jesus' 12 disciples. John's Gospel provides us with more character information about Thomas. Thomas is mentioned three times in John's Gospel. We first meet Thomas when Jesus was going to Bethany because Lazarus was ill unto death. The disciples warned Jesus not to go to Bethany because his opponents tried to stone and kill him the last time he was in that area. Thomas, though, valiantly tries to encourage his fellow disciples by saying, let us also go that we may go and die with him. Thomas is mentioned a second time at the Last Supper. At the Last Supper, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his de departure and consoles them by saying, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you also may be, and you know the way where I am going. But Thomas does not know what Jesus means by his words, and he sincerely asks for directions. How can we know the way? He asked Jesus. Jesus answered Thomas with these beautiful words, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to God except through me. Today's scripture mentions Thomas for the third time in John's gospel. This third mention of Thomas famously cast him throughout the ages as doubting Thomas. I'm not persuaded that Thomas was a doubter. Given the behavior in the other gospel stories in John, I believe that Thomas was a believer and a deeply devoted follower of Jesus. He proved himself by his willingness to die with Jesus and his willingness to follow Jesus wherever he was going. Thomas remained faithful, 
even when he could not fully understand what was happening in his life. He had not renounced his devotion to Jesus and he had not abandoned his fellowship in the church or with his other disciples. Thomas did not require re-evangelization. Thomas's faith in Jesus Christ was at a new point that prompted a questioning search for deeper understanding. Unlike Judas, who renounced Jesus and his fellow disciples on the night of the Last Supper never to return, Thomas did not reject Jesus or the disciples, his community of faith. Thomas is still, after all, with the disciples, even though he's not yet at the same spiritual place that they are at. And that's okay. We know from experience that not everyone in our churches is at the same place or that they agree, right? The important thing is that Thomas is still present, struggling perhaps, but still availing himself of and spiritually benefiting from the prayers, the hymns, the shared meals, the study of scripture, the preaching, the fellowship of the faith community, their care, encouragement, and love for him. The disciples do not get frustrated with Thomas and put him out of the fellowship. Instead, they nurtured, cared for, and loved him in his season of spiritual struggle. Thomas is struggling. He's struggling to make sense of the new truth about Jesus. Sometimes new understandings of Jesus and how we live for him as we move forward in light of the new understanding about his humanity, his, divi his divinity, and his mission in the world just take time. These spiritual breakthroughs and adaptations to our understanding and how we live as disciples come only oftentimes after seasons of desolation caused by life crisis and setbacks, suffering and disappointment. But notice the tender love and patience of Jesus with Thomas. Jesus comes in search of Thomas to personally encounter him. He goes to Thomas like a shepherd looking for a lost sheep, like a friend coming to help another friend. He appealed to Thomas's need for persuasive evidence and meets him where he's at. Jesus does not attack Thomas or treat him with contempt. He doesn't say, man, Thomas, you blew it. He's there to help Thomas cross a new threshold in his faith journey. Jesus' calming presence was more persuasive than his words or the proof he was ready to provide Thomas with. Thomas does not need to put his finger in Jesus' wounds after all. His direct experience of Jesus overcame his reluctance to take the next step of faith. Thomas becomes the first disciple to acknowledge and confess Jesus' divinity when he exclaimed, My Lord and my God. Thomas' new understanding of Jesus' divinity blessed him. Christian tradition claims that Thomas became an apostle to India in, 50, in 52 BC and was martyred and buried there after witnessing to the Indian community. Jesus also insists that those who believe without seeing are also blessed through a faith created by hearing others' testimony. Jamie Clark Souls, professor of New Testament at Perkins School of Theology, explains how people come to believe in John's gospel and how many of us have come to believe in Jesus receiving life in his name. She says that Thomas's discipleship journey follows the pattern of one person encountering Jesus. They share their experience with another person who often uh, most expresses some type of reluctance. Then that person experiences Jesus on their own directly and becomes convinced about Jesus and then shares the news about Jesus with the next person and that person is reluctant and then believes and then shares and it goes on and on. And the refrain is always the same. I have found the Lord. Come and meet him for yourself. The challenge with Thomas's story is that we think we'll understand it by reading it. We can't. Faith is an encounter with the risen Lord. An encounter that has to be directly experienced on our own. I've personally experienced several encounters with the risen Lord Throughout my walk of faith, I've encountered Christ at spiritual retreats, 
a worship service, a Bible study, in the liturgies of the church, in times of prayer, in a conversation with a fellow Christian, through the care and concern of another, in the lyrics of a Christian hymn or song, in Christian art, sometimes in the suffering faces of others, and sometimes during personal suffering, struggles, and while wrestling with elephant-sized spiritual questions. Is an elephant-sized spiritual question taking up room in your heart, in your mind, or your soul this morning? Is the size and burden of it crushing you and leading you to a deeper search for spiritual understanding? Don't worry. Christ is at work in you. You're becoming a more devoted follower of Christ right now, even though it may not feel like it. Thomas was there. Christians throughout the ages have been there. I've been there. Maybe you're there today. You can trust that the Lord will see you through to the other side. Whatever you do, don't give up on the church. Thomas didn't, and the church didn't give up on him. Continue to partake of God's means of grace through worship, prayer, scripture reading, singing psalms, Christian fellowship, the partaking of Holy Communion, generosity, and service. No matter how significant your elephant-sized struggle or question might be, be patient with yourself. Be patient with the church. Be patient with the Lord, just as the church is patient with you and as the Lord is patient with you. The Lord is your shepherd. You are important to the Lord. He loves you and wants to give you life abundant. He will come when you least expect it and give you the peace and answers you are searching for. It can be a frightening and vulnerable place to be at when we are beginning or at the middle of a spiritual transformation. Be patient, don't be afraid. Only believe and wait. You can release your elephant-sized resistance and reluctance and questions. Christ encounters you this morning, invites you to trust him with your life and to take the next step of faith. He wants you to join him in mission in the world so that all may know God's love for them in him believe in him and find life in his name abundant and eternal may the risen lord abide with you abide in you and fill you so his life in you overflows like rivers of living waters for a god-searching world peace Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this message this morning from Bishop Signs. It certainly had a lot of thought-provoking points, and I just wanted to touch briefly on a couple of those before we close today. So the two main points that we want to come away with today is Thomas and the church. So I thought the bishop did an incredible job of helping us to understand the true character of Thomas. Poor Thomas had proven himself as a true believer and a loyal disciple. He'd followed Jesus and was willing to die for him, but he had doubts one time, doubts about the most incredible and mind-blowing event that had ever been witnessed, doubts that I think every single one of us could understand. And now Thomas is forever labeled the doubting disciple. It's really pretty unfair if you think about it. I know I wouldn't want to be remembered for the times that I've had questions or doubts about my faith. Thomas faced a spiritual struggle because he just wasn't in a place to wrap his mind around a concept as great as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He missed out on seeing Jesus when he came to see the disciples, so all he had was that word of mouth, and who could blame him for asking questions about something so illogical after he'd witnessed the crucifixion? I imagine that all of us can relate to Thomas. We all go through seasons where we have doubts and questions, there are events in our lives that challenge our faith, no matter how strong we may be. There are storms that rock us at our very core and make it hard to set aside our humanness and rely on Jesus out of that pure trust and faith, even though we know it's exactly what we should do. 
It's in those times that we need the church. Jesus knew we needed each other. He taught the, the disciples the importance of Christian fellowship. Many are always stronger than one. He never intended for us to walk our faith journey alone. In Thomas's time of doubt, we, dis we saw the disciples sticking with him. They didn't chastise, chastise him for his questions. They didn't try to cram the truth down his throat. They walked alongside of him. It was Jesus himself that came to meet Thomas to help him gain an understanding of that greater truth. That's our job as the church. We are all called to walk alongside fellow believers on our journey. We're supposed to be here together as a community of faith to care for one another, to love one another, and most importantly, to encourage one another. We will all encounter Christ in our own way and in our own time. And when we do, it's our job to share that story. We are all expected to play an active role as followers of Christ by doing those things to grow the kingdom of God. There will be times that we all suffer and struggle, and we are Thomas living in that doubt. In those moments, we have access to the church. We have this amazing family here to lean on and to reach out to, and church, be there. Nurture one another, just as Jesus and his disciples did for Thomas. Pastor Todd will be starting a new sermon series when he gets back, and we will really get to think about our role as followers of Christ and also our role in the church and what Jesus intended for it to be. I can promise that Jesus didn't die for us to just sit here and be consumers. He didn't die for us to just sit here and really hope that what we get is what we want all of the time. I don't think that Jesus hoped for us to sit here all of the time and hope that we only get to sing our favorite songs and hope that the sermon is really, really short. The title of this sermon series is Jesus Didn't Die, dot, dot, dot. On this one, punctuation really is everything. It's not Jesus didn't die, period. It's not Jesus didn't die, exclamation. It's dot, 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 as in there's more. It's to be continued. Jesus didn't die so that we could be victims or powerless or lifeless. Jesus died so we could truly experience life in the power of his spirit. This church is amazing. We're filled with wonderful people and we have so much life in us. Sometimes we're Thomas and that's okay. As long as we never give up on ourselves, we never give up on Jesus, and we never give up on the church. Let's focus on being the church so that when one of us faces a season of struggle, we are all here to lift them up. As we close this morning, let's lift our voices to worship because God truly is a good, good father. Would you like to stand? <clears throat>
Amen. We thank you, Lord, that you are our good, good Father. I want to remind you all that we are here Wednesday nights at 6.30 for worship, so come and join us. May God's peace be with you. Have a great week.